Hey everybody and welcome. Thank you all so very much for coming this evening. It's truly a pleasure to introduce my colleague from Slavic languages, Dr. Mila Fyodorova. There are a few things more exciting or more central in the life of a scholar in the humanities than the publication of a book. Months and months of work go into conceptualizing it, intertwined with years and years of research, not to mention the endless hours of the actual writing. Yankees and Petrograd Bolsheviks in New York is a book that has more than rewarded its author for the time she devoted to it. Born out of a course that Dr. Fyodorov developed here at Georgetown, Yankees and Petrograd is a highly original study and a book of the first importance. After we've read it, we find ourselves asking, how is it that up until now such a rich topic has received so little scholarly attention? This is the most complimentary question we can ask of any book, and it derives from the fact that fine scholarship uncovers patterns of major significance where no one previously thought to look. Yankees and Petrograd juxtaposes travelogues written by a series of late 19th and early 20th century Russian writers who traveled to America. Dr. Fyodorov traces an intertextual chain in which Gorky begets Yesenian and Mayakovsky, who in turn beget Pilniak and Ilf and Petrov. She documents through scrupulous textual analysis how essentially interrelated all of these travel travelogues are among themselves. Each new traveler relies on his predecessors to describe an America experienced more through texts than through actual observation. And this mythologized textual America, Mirabile Dictu, tells us much, much more about the Russian traveler's own aspirations and dreams than it does about America. America emerges in the travelogues as a failed experiment, a disappointing beta vision of the new world. The real new world, in the meantime, turns out to be in Soviet Russia, as witnessed by Dr. Fyodorov's reverse travelogues. Russian texts like Marshak's Mr. Twister in the Land of the Bolsheviks that narrate fictionalized adventures and misadventures of Americans who visit the Soviet Union. It has become a commonplace among Slavists to say that literature is the privileged mode of discourse in Russia. Things that can't safely be mooted in the political arena can nonetheless, assuming of course that the author is careful, be aired on the written page. Dr. Fyodorova unpacks and scrutinizes this old chestnut and uncovers its mechanics at work. At the same time, she opens a new chapter in the study of cross-cultural perceptions and enriches and enlivens our insights into the vexed and vexing relations between the 20th century's two great giants, the Soviet Union and the United States. I will close by saying that the only thing that really needs to be said is, read this book. Thank you very much, Dr. Morris, for introducing me. And I have to say that I'm very grateful to uh, my colleagues present here, to Dr. Morris, who was uh, the first reader and critic of my book. And I had a wonderful opportunity of discussing my books at all the stages uh, with my colleagues. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Ceres and uh, Department of Slavic Languages um, and the Martara Center for this opportunity to share uh, the book with my colleagues and friends and my students. By the way, this book emerged uh, out of a course with the same title, Yankees in Petrograd, Bolsheviks in New York, and uh, two students who were in the original course are present here. So I'm very grateful for you too. One of the greatest fears I had as a child was war between America and Russia. And I remember waking up at night during a thunderstorm and thinking, is it uh, actually a thunderstorm or maybe it is the war between the Soviet Union and the United States? And many Russian people of my generation report on the same fear. Uh, and many Americans of slightly older generation uh, brought up on the films like Invasions of the Body Snatchers <laughs> <laughs> also do. And yet America was a dream world and a very positive connotation coexisted with this anxiety. And my grandmother used to say about my grandfather, who had some practical talents, that in America his inventiveness would have been appreciated. 
and there he would have been a millionaire. So this combination of anxiety and idealization in the attitude towards America is very typical for the common Russian mind. And Perestroika was so invigorating not only because the freedom of speech and freedom of mind, mind it brought, but also because of the improving relationships and freedom of this fear of America. And it also made the dream of America very real. It was not impossible to go there any longer. And in a way, Perestroika destroyed the dream, since what dream can compete with the reality? And a rock song by uh, the group Nautilus Pompilius, very popular in the 90s, runs Goodbye America, the land where I have never been. For such a long time, we have been taught to love your forbidden fruit. And now tensions between the United States and Russia worry me from a very different perspective, from the other side of the ocean. And in the tragically cyclical Russian history, the image of America that existed in the Soviet Union is still very much alive. Uh, although America itself is much closer now. And the attitude to America is still characterized by a paradoxical superimposition of the superiority and inferiority complex. Um, and I wrote this book because I wanted to investigate how and when this image of America, fearsome yet irresistible, uh, has come into being. And why is it America that functions as the ultimate other for the Russians? Uh, in the Russian texts about America, one aspect is particularly striking. In Nikolai Chernyshevsky's novel, What is to be done, one of the protagonists uh, pretends to commit suicide, yet in reality he goes to America. And conversely, in Fyodor Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, the antagonist Svidrigailov announces, I am going to America, yet he commits suicide. Um, when in America, on the other shore, as Russians put it, Russian emigre characters and writers often feel that although they have now acquired a new life, this life is very similar to posthumous experience. All their previous relationships and obligations suddenly become irrelevant. Uh, for example, when a merchant in Vladimir Bogaraz's novella Avdotia and Rivka, 1902, uh, tries to persuade Avdotia, an emigre, to marry him in New York, although she still has uh, a husband back home. He argues, Russia is there, and what's here is America. It's as if you have died and found yourself in the other world. And uh, those who, whose relatives left the Soviet Union in the 1980s know this sensation of parting with the loved ones uh, forever. And uh, the emigrants turned into shadows in the valley of the, death, uh, of the dead. And there was no chance of seeing them again. And uh, of course, this mythological perception of the new world is not exclusively Russian. Uh, from the moment of, it, of its discovery, America has offered a universal object of projection for Europeans. It was a utopia finally located and it represented the materialization of mankind's dreams about uh, the golden age, about paradise. And as we know, each country discovers its own new world uh, in conformity with its geographical location and cultural traditions, demands of the historical moments. Uh, however, Russia has always claimed special associations with America. And it was a parallel uh, between Russia and America recognized by other nations uh, because of the two countries' relative youth, uh, rapid development over the last two centuries, uh, vast territories, and social experimentation. Not to mention the fact that uh, uh, Russia literally discovered America from the other side by crossing the Bering Strait. And uh, perhaps no other country has so often compared itself with and contrast, uh, contrasted itself to America. Uh, the scale of the social revolution in Russia is often compared with the scale of the technological revolution in America. And indeed, Russians today 
still perceive the world primarily as bipolar and believe that world's fate depends on Russian-American relation, uh, relations, even if for other countries and for America itself uh, the situation might seem uh, slightly different. Um, the American text of Russian literature representing America as the other world uh, exists in two modes, one positive and one negative. And the conception of America as the other world in its idyllic uh, paradisal version is present, for example, in Alexander Herzen's drama, uh, William Penn, uh, which refers to America as the promised land. Uh, but by contrast, the macabre otherworldliness um, uh, of the land beyond the ocean is explicit even in the titles of travelogues written by Russian radicals. For example, Vladimir Karolenko's uh, Factory of Death, or Maxim Gorky's City of the Yellow Devil, or uh, Yesenin's Iron Min Mirgorod. And significantly, the most influential, uh, influential literary texts of the 19th and early 20th century belong to this second negative mode. So my book studies this myth of America as the other world in its transition from its uh, Russian to its Soviet version. And I found uh, that the book cover by Sean Olhaus uh, wonderful because it literally conveys the concept of the book, how America is viewed from the prism of hammer and sickle. And, uh, while in pre-revolutionary texts, America, uh, in its opposition to Russia, uh, could appear as either utopian or dystopian, in Soviet times, uh, the paradigm officially shifts towards the Soviet Union as, a par as the, the paradise and America as hell. However, in popular thinking, uh, the mass media and fiction, the positive mode still existed, unofficially existed, and in the 20s, paradoxically, even flourished. So in my book, I study this very curious phenomenon of late 19th and early 20th century, the pilgrimages to America uh, by prominent Russian writers who wrote travelogues. And, uh, symptomatically, during this period, America became an especially crucial point of attractions for Russians who played uh, key roles in shaping the identity of the new Soviet state. Uh, Leon Trotsky, Gorky, Vladimir Mayakovsky. Uh, for them, it was the transatlantic republic rather than the old world that served as the crucial point of departure in this ideological creation of the self-identity of the new Soviet state. And paradoxically, Russians were ready to use America that they considered hell as a blueprint for the future utopia they were building. Uh, and while I concentrate my analysis on the most influential travelogues, I studied them against the background of lesser known texts dealing with the American theme. And I spent, spent a lot of time in archives studying, for example, the memoirs of workers who visited America in the 20s, or uh, the scripts of uh, mock trials of Henry Ford. <laughs> uh, to some extent, any travelogue is an instrument of, uh, for studying the other as much as for exploring oneself. And uh, the distinguishing feature of American travelogues written by Russian is the extremely high degree of focus on the self. So what the travelers look for and what they uh, inevitably find is their own country. Uh, so they go to America in order to find Russia. And they recognize Russian elements everywhere they go. Yesenin, for example, uh, writes about Broadway. This street is ours. Uh, Mayakovsky compares Hudson with Volga on Manhattan. And uh, perhaps most strikingly, uh, most of these texts are stories of non-meeting with America, of not seeing the new world for what it was. Um, Daniel Harms' children's story about Kolka Pankin and Petka Yershov going to America is very characteristic in this respect. 
Uh, in this story, the two boys take an airplane thinking that they are going to America. And they are attracted by the familiar set of exotic images associated with America. Palms, wild beasts, and Indians. And although the friends never get farther than uh, a nearest village outside of Leningrad, it's enough for Kolka to believe that they have visited the America. Uh, in his imagination, a cow turns into bison and sparrows into hummingbirds and a pine is a palm. Uh, and village boys successfully play the roles of Native Americans, creating an association between Russians, Russian and American so-called savages that is very symptomatic for uh, Soviet travelogue tradition, which harms um, ironically reinterprets. Um, so reading the texts about America, we see multiple projections. Russian serves are projected onto African Americans. And in the 19th century, Russian journalism um, used the uh, criticism of slavery in America as a code for discussing the problems of serfdom at home. And Circassians were often projected uh, onto Native Americans. Uh, like in Daniel Harms' story, uh, instead of the actual America, in all the texts we find a literary model representing an ideological construct. So I suggest that Russian travelogues about America can be seen as a particular type of narrative that owes uh, less to first-hand first impressions uh, than to the framework imposed by literary tradition. And in other words, the travelers read America instead of seeing it. Uh, Ilfan Petrov, for example, write, we glided over the country as over the chapters of a long entertaining novel, uh, repressing in, ourself, in ourselves the legitimate desire of the impatient reader to take a look at the last page. Uh, the America they observed must have seemed reminiscent of a literary America they already knew. And indeed, pre-revolutionary and Soviet travelogues constitute a, tra a text replete with references to hell and suspiciously, suspiciously reminiscent of Dante's Inferno. Uh, so, uh, of course, we cannot ignore writers' ideological determinism and censorship restrictions, but the primary focus on, of my book is the literary representation of ideological matters. And while the transformations of America in uh, the Russian mind has attracted historians, there hasn't been a literary study of the American travelogue narrative. So studying the American text of Russian literature, I had to make uh, a strategic decision about the structure of the book. Should I follow the chronology or should I focus on the uh, recurrent motifs that constitute the American text? Should I study the similarities between all the works? Uh, so I decided to do both, and uh, the first part uh, of my book is a brief overview of the main stages in the development of the American travel narrative. And in the second part, I studied the recurrent motifs that the writers borrow from each other and develop. So chronologically, we have three periods uh, in the history of American journeys. Uh, Karolienkas and Gorky's early pre-revolutionary travelogues uh, which is characterized in disil di disillusionment in the forms taken by American democracy in the everyday life. And during the second stage, immediately following the revolution of the 1917, American travelogues are inspired uh, both by attempts to establish a new Soviet identity vis-a-vis uh, -vis America as the other, and by a search for uh, what might be borrowed from America to build the new Soviet state. And Yesenin and Mayakovsky, the most significant of the post-revolutionary travelers and literary, literary rivals, agree on the paradoxical backwardness of America and its provincialism. So they admire the externals of American technology, but criticize the social order and narrow-mindedness that underline this industrial uh, advancement. Uh, 
paradoxically, they believe that it, will, it would still be beneficial to introduce machines into the human Soviet state, where there could be no danger of introducing inhumanity. And in the third stage, Pilnyak and Ilfan Petrov in the 30s uh, write less rhetorical uh, travelogues because Soviet ideology has already been stabilized uh, at home in the Soviet Union. So uh, the revolutionary pathos that is so evident in the early travelogues uh, uh, becomes milder uh, during the third stage. And uh, these travelers uh, undertake the most extensive journeys, exploring America by automobile, and they create wider, more analytical pictures. And between these three periods, a significant semantic shift occurs in the Russian perception of America. Uh, early travelers associate America with urbanism and search its cities for uh, the genuine America. And they represent America as the urban hell. Post-revolutionary travelers claim that American urbanism is in fact provincial. And uh, Pilnyak and Ilfan Petrov make the association between American provincialism the focal point of their journey. And they search for the real America beyond the urban realm. Uh, they uh, study one-storied America, towns and villages. And in their perception, America is the hell of endless repetitions of the same little towns and highways and gas stations. Uh, and all these stages in the development of the American narratives use the same imagery, which writer after writer picks up and develops further. And the major examples I, uh, of recurrent motifs I have identified are the following. Uh, the transatlantic journey, mythological crossing into the other world. And then statues coming to life, especially the Statue of Liberty, which is treated as an ironic symbol. And it is uh, often described as small, greenish, and hollow. Uh, and it is disparaged as a woman. And uh, the writers obscenely report that she is hiding a prison of Ellis Island under the pleats of her skirt. Uh, another motif, efficient but inhuman technology, especially electricity. Uh, the travelers cannot help admiring the lights of New York, but they are also outraged that noble electricity is tamed and turned into a circus animal, that it has to uh, uh, jump to make ele electric advertisement work instead of performing the noble task of uh, giving light to workers. Uh, smoking, uh, the iconic image of a smoking uh, factory pipe is perceived in parallel with a capitalist smoking a cigar. And uh, since America does not smoke any longer, now we have a curious collision of the image of, the, of cigar, which is distinctively American, and the unnaturally healthy style of life, which is also perceived as American. <laughs> uh, alien food, maybe I had uh, most fun writing this chapter. Uh, uh, food in America is considered tasteless and orderless, and it fails to nourish a Soviet traveler. Uh, travelers are always hungry while they are uh, traveling. Uh, Ford's factory is an indispensable item of the traveling writer's itinerary, and it is described as both magnificent and inhuman. Native Americans and African Americans, the racial other. In the travelogues, um, uh, African Americans are treated with much more sympathy than uh, Native Americans. Uh, Native Americans are blamed for not fighting for their freedom. Um, amusement and entertainment. According to Tolstoy, happy families are all alike. Uh, and every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. But the American travelogues demonstrate that in grief and misfortune, all nations are alike. And suffering is universal while the reasons for amusement, as well as the methods of amusing themselves, are quite different. And what brings joy to Americans seems horrifying or just pitiful to, uh, for, the social, uh, for the Russian traveler. 
uh, they describe Coney Island, pinball machines, and uh, they go to strip tease, and we have to ask ourselves why they choose uh, these American amusement to uh, describe in their travelogues. And it is uh, important to remember that none of these writers spoke English. Uh, all of them found themselves in America without a tongue. Uh, like the characters of Karalenka's eponymous novel Bez Yizika. Uh, all their reported conversations with Americans uh, were, were distorted by this language barrier. Ironically, even their linguistic deficiency contributed to the continuity of the genre. Uh, interestingly, Russian travelers often blamed the language they were unable to master for its incomprehensibility and irrationality. <laughs> Gorky, struggling with uh, English at his friend's uh, Adirondack's estate, complains that though Americans are rational, their language is not. <laughs> and uh, the narrator in uh, Vladimir uh, Bogaraz's Black Student discovers on his way across America that although people look uh, familiar looking, <laughs> they cannot speak the language familiar to him. <laughs> and uh, he says, um, I would be on the verge of speaking to others in my native tongue when, screwing up their mouths, they emitted not broad, rich Russian, but those dull, in, um, indeterminable, uh, indeterminate Anglo-Saxon sounds, which resemble the wheezing of a broken barrel organ. <laughs> uh, and I would fall silent and walk past them. Um, and in the reversal of the accepted stereotype, Mayakovsky finds Americans non-talkative, skupaslovi, projecting his own inability to comprehend English onto native speakers of English. And um, a crucial factor uh, in uniting the American travelogues and providing the framework for their ongoing dialogue is the Gagolian sub subtext. So the American chronotope is generally structured according to the same principles as the artistic space of Gogol's tales, and especially Dead Souls. Uh, and Gogol's Dead Souls was a Russian vision and version of Dante's descent into hell. So in American travelogues of Russian writer, the model of Dante's Inferno is mediated through Gogol. Um, Russians usually represent America as an enclosed and isolated space. Multiple temporal paradoxes create the impression that it is located outside of time. And by the end of the 19th century, the concept of a young America uh, uh, fades away and is replaced by a more complex paradigm. America appears simultaneously modern and ancient. And a journey to America entails not only geographical and temporal dimensions, but also ethical value. And it is a descent into the accursed land of rationalism, materialism, and egoism. In other words, capitalism. And in this respect, Soviet travelogues rem resemble medieval Russian pilgrimages to the land of sinners. Uh, but still, Soviet writer has to undertake this journey in order to appreciate the beauty of his native land. Uh, in the same way as the descent into hell prepared Dante for revelations of paradise. Um, and curiously, I discovered the same recurrent motifs, but with the opposite meaning in Russian texts and films about Americans traveling to Russia. Uh, like Mar Marshak's Mr. Twister and Shaginyan's Yankees in Petrograd, uh, Kulishov's film The Incredible Adventures of Mr. West in the Land of the Bolsheviks, so in the second part of my book, about Yankees in Petrograd, I write about an imaginary American that discovers Soviet Russia. And in Soviet Russia, electricity, of course, facilitates thriving of socialism. Automobile factories are modeled after Fords, but they are especially human. Food is natural and delicious. Uh, and uh, internationalism is a supreme value. The cities are, of course, healthy and dynamic. Uh, so the American hero heading to Russia anticipates finding himself in hell, but he benefits from the Soviet experience and his consciousness is awakened and he happily realizes that the Soviet Russia is a real paradise. And although I wrote 
a scholarly book. I believe that uh, the story of Russian writers as America in America deserves a novel because so many mysterious coincidences took place there. If we take the factual uh, realities of these journeys, we can, uh, as a text, we can trace a number of other recurrent themes. Uh, for example, uh, both Karolenka and Gorky's little daughters unfortunately died in Russia during their father's American sojourns. And uh, this seems to have been a greater tragedy for Karolenka than for Gorky, because Gorky just writes uh, in, his, in the end of business letter, I have been experiencing news of this kind at any moment, and it did not shock me. I am sorry about the girl and even more about Ekaterina Pavlovna, his wife, with whom he did not live at that moment. Blunders and complications involving children become almost universal in the American journeys. While in America, Mayakovsky fathered a daughter with a Russian emigrant, Ellie Jones, and uh, this daughter, Patricia Thompson, whom Mayakovsky met only once, published a book uh, in 1993 entitled Mayakovsky in Manhattan. And Yesenin did not have any children. However, during Yesenin's American journey, one of the emigrant newspapers printed a belated report on his uh, short-term imprisonment at Ellis Island, which included the following error. Miss Isadora Duncan, with her husband, a young Russian poet, Sergei Yesenin, and their two children, non-existent <laughs> children, were forbidden entry to the territory of the United States. And uh, both Ilf and Petrov felt especially homesick and constantly wrote home to their young wives and small children. And uh, their letters filled with inqu uh, inquiries about the children were later published by Ilf's daughter, Alexandra Ilf. But maybe Ilf and Petrov were the happiest of all the travelers uh, since their children were real, alive, and legitimate. <laughs> Uh, so the title of my book, Yankees and Petrograd Bolsheviks in New York, should not be read literally, since many of the visitors were not technically Bolsheviks. And uh, so the title is based on the title of Mar Maria Tashiginyan's sci-fi adventure travelogue, Yankees in Petrograd, uh, which in its own turn, based on Mark Twain's connected with Yan Yankee in King Arthur's court. And uh, like Yankees in Petrograd, the generalizing formula Bolsheviks in New York rather emulates a cliched point of view according to which all the visitors uh, from a certain country are similar. Uh, one of my book's tasks is to deconstruct this cliche and to show the peculiarities of each writer and each period against the general unifying post-populist uh, uh, and socialist tradition. One of my first reviewers asked, uh, why would American readers want to read something so negative about America? And I have to confess that this book tells much more about Russians uh, than about America. And uh, while reading it, it is especially important to remember that what sometimes stands behind the condemnations and criticisms of America uh, in the Russian text is not merely a rejection and fear of the American other, but uh, this text represent recognition of, Russians, of Russia's own failings and reflections of its complexes and Russia's hope for a better future. Thank you. Uh, I know Gorky and Karolinko were living in different times, but given that Yesenin, Mayakovsky, and the others were um, intending on going back to Russia, how do you think they balanced their, their writerly task, just as individual writers, against the ideological task that was expected of them? Um, I think that um, they did not separate their ideological task and their actual experience. That um, I think that they very sincerely perceived America uh, in this framework, ideological framework, and they were prepared to see what they what they saw. So it's not uh, creating the ideology, uh, only creating artificially the ideological concept of America, but seeing America 
uh, like that. This was a very interesting talk. Why did the different writers come to America? Did they have similar or different reasons? Were they sent by a newspaper? Why did they come? Why did they choose to come? Uh, they had very different reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they were sent. Uh, Trotsky, for example, sent Yesenin uh, mm -hmm. to America. He thought that Yesenin lacks the urban motifs in his uh, poetry, <laughs> so he really benefit from America. <laughs> Curiously, uh, Yesenian describes America in terms of a village, <laughs> so he did not benefit in this respect at all. Uh, Mayakovsky could not just allow Yesenian to be the first one, <laughs> and he thought that of all writers, he, the uh, urbanist, the avant-garde poet, should go to America and describe it. And he says that he went to America to prove that he did not have to come because he knew everything in advance. And he had described America in his um, uh, poem written several years earlier, uh, 15, uh, 15 Millions. Uh, Ilfan Pet uh, Petrov uh, came uh, because they had an assignment uh, from, from a newspaper. Pilniak, uh had a very complicated relationship with the authorities by the moment of his journey. And he, I think, wanted to prove that he was loyal to the Soviet state. Uh, so there were, uh, Gorky came with a practical task. He wanted to uh, collect money for the Bolsheviks party. And he wanted to persuade America not to uh, support the, uh, the government after a 1905 revolution. So they were uh, different, but at the same time similar, uh, because all of them knew what they were going to find. Yes. I'm looking forward to reading the book. Um, I have many questions, but I'll try to limit myself to one or two. <coughs> um, I wonder, first of all, how much room you give for, given that there was this canon and they were all copying one another, which is common in travel logs, and you see it in Western visitors to the early modern Russia and European visitors. They're all reading one another and copying the same tropes. Um, but how much room do you need for kind of innovation of each separate writer? And I'm especially thinking of Ilfin Petrov's on that Pashna America, which in some ways is quite different because it's not the land of skyscrapers, but, but the one story America. And it seems like I wonder how much they <clears throat> broke away from the canon. Mm -hmm. And secondly, given the theme of provincialism, and you often see this in the notion that American specialists are very strong in their one field, but childlike and, and not cultured in broadly, and so on. I wonder if there's any filtering or awareness of European views of the United States. And I think in the case of Ilya Ehrenborg, you could make a strong case that all these decades in Paris strongly influenced his views of the United States. Well, he would in a later period and I'm not mm -hmm. sure you covered it. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. And you have partially answered your <laughs> the, uh, own question. I tried to balance uh, the similarities and the and what constituted the uh, American travelogue and the uh, new features each uh, author introduced. So uh, in the first, uh, in, in the part dedicated to the recurrent motifs, I tried to study uh, what, what constituted these motifs. And I, in the chapters about the concrete writers, I tried to discuss what specific uh, was there uh, in their travelogues. Um, about uh, European journeys, uh, yes. European journeys, of course, informed, and uh, European travelogues informed uh, Russian writers, Russian travelers. And, uh, but I try to focus on the Russian tradition in the introduction. I pay uh, special attention to French and German uh, images of America that were popular in Russia. Uh, I think especially Henry Ford and the perception of American factories was 
uh, mediated through European uh, sources. Because uh, for Russians, it was important to compare uh, the German uh, image of Henry Ford and uh, the specifically Russian ones. And they um, tried to comment on the, the specifically Russian ones. Why, for us, Ford uh, is, not, is not German and not American. And uh, they described him as our own Henry Ford. <laughs> Um, you, at one point you said that uh, the writers see America as the land of accursed rationalism, materialism, and egoism, in other words, capitalism. But uh, wouldn't rationalism be part of the communist you know, project? Was that something that was specific to America? Uh, everywhere in American travelogues we deal with the double standard. <laughs> but a um, communist image, um, self communist self-perception was considered more romantic than uh, rationalist. Uh, although they tried to introduce Ford's and Taylor's uh, methods uh, to Russia, somehow they did not associate it with uh, the negative image of rationalism. Although uh, sometimes they uh, criticize Americans for building this advanced technology uh, without understanding what they were doing. Uh, and they said that America is a miracle that happened to children. Um, but uh, yes, I agree that at some extent this perception of Russia know knowingly uh, introducing this technology uh, is is present indeed, but um, even this rationalism is perceived as uh, romantic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this is a very fascinating topic, and I I was wondering if you saw if you could elaborate a little bit if you saw what you saw as far as regional differences. Um, in the treatment of these travelogues. Granted, they're not officially writers, but I've been reading, for instance, Kalatosov's um, Litsovoli Buddha, right? Mm -hmm. Eisenstein King, Mindra Viva Mexico, which I think is wonderfully ironic. And so I was wondering if you saw sort of differences in regional, regional listen, you know, if they landed in New York City, that affected the division more than, say, if they landed in California. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second question is if you could also elaborate a little bit more on that racialized otherness element of the perception. Um, because again, I'm thinking to Langston Hughes' memoirs, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm thinking about this, how the Russian image funneled through the African-American intellectual class and the engineers recruiting other engineers to go to Russia to do the work. This one, if you could elaborate on that. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, most writers uh, followed the same route. They landed in uh, New York, and then sometimes they went to different places. So there are several topoi in the travelogues, and maybe they chose the cities uh, they visited because the previous writers uh, visited them. Um, uh, the directors, yes, visited California, visited Hollywood. Uh, California is also present on the map of uh, the writers who came in the 30s. Um, I, I try to discuss uh, these specific places. Uh, New York as the emblem of uh, urban hell. Uh, Niagara Falls as um, a miracle and um, a natural equivalent of, of New York. Uh, then Chicago was is also a very popular uh, destination point, the city uh, of the factory of death. Uh, uh, California is another example of, um, for, for the later writers, uh, California is the ultimate America because it, on the one hand, represents this one-storied America, uh, but also it is a combination of nature and a human thought and technology uh, transforming the nature. Uh, 
uh, but Hollywood is usually seen as uh, the ultimate illusion, the, uh, the most fake thing uh, in America. I would say that in the 30s there is a tendency towards um, representing Hollywood as emblematic for, uh, for America because of uh, this idea of America as, a, uh, America as a pure decoration. They were obsessed with the external side of America. Sometimes I wonder, uh, I doubt that they were able to look deeper and see anything uh, behind the surface. Um, uh, specifically, what is specifically other? Why uh, the American is uh, constructed as the other? Um, Again, here we have a combination of uh, the other, not the other and the other, uh, but seeing Americans as very s uh, similar to Russians, and at the same time, um, uh, only um, similar only uh, externally. Um, Russians. Uh, were interested in Americans, uh, in American workers, uh, American peasants, but they did not have much uh, opportunities to meet with uh, American intellectuals, uh, at least until Ivan Petrov's uh, journeys and Pirniak's journeys. Uh, so, for them, uh, when when these writers described the intellectuals that were sympathetic towards the Soviet Union, they described them as us, as Swahi. But uh, when they described capitalists, they were this other. So I, I think that the border is uh, between those sympathetic towards uh, socialism and American capitalism. I was curious about, uh, well, I enjoyed your description of tonguelessness and the wheezing asthmatic sounds of English and the <laughs> alien nature of the language, if it's even a language at all. I'm wondering to what extent that motif is resonating in Russia right now with the rise of global English, because there seems to be this real tension between acceptance grudgingly of, of the role of global English and of the elite at least uh, really striving to learn English while at the same time uh, even the very same people who are striving to learn it uh, have a certain backlash against it as well um, as illustrated in you know, the reactions against widespread borrowings among the purists but even among ordinary people. Mm -hmm. Uh, interestingly, uh, the writers and scholars who uh, express concerns about the intervention of English into modern Russian compare modern Russian with the uh, Russian of uh, the immigrants mm -hmm. living in New York described in the works of uh, Ilfan Petrov and Pilnyak. So they, they think that the processes in the, uh, taking place in the language in Russian now are similar to uh, the mutations of Russians uh, occurring in diaspora. Um, you mentioned how uh, the authors talked about the strange entertainment in the in uh -huh. America. I'm curious if they talk about what the good image of entertainment is in Russia. Mm -hmm. What's good? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Petrov wrote a short, not only this one story in America, but the short story of Tonya, uh, where the protagonist is not autobiographical, but a simple woman who has to live in uh, the Soviet embassy. And she is so bored by America, uh, and uh, she receives letters from her friends in uh, the Soviet Russia who go to uh, some socialist uh, concerts, uh, parties, and the factories. Um, and they meet, sometimes they even meet foreigners there. But they are surrounded by very friendly uh, fellow workers. And uh, the only case, I think, when uh, Tonya feels 
happy is at the New Year party in the Soviet embassy. Uh, so the entertainment should be collective, but uh, Soviet. They should dance and, uh, uh, and sing together. Uh, uh, usually, American entertainment is the solitary one. Uh, the spectators are isolated from each other. Uh, Soviet entertainment is uh, collective. Maybe there's something to that. <laughs> <laughs> Where did they get their impressions of African Americans and American Indians from? From, from James literature. Fenimore Cooper, or uh, in Fenimore Cooper, the image is much more romantic. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they, uh -huh. no, I was just thinking because if they if they if the criticism is that they didn't uh, revolt against their condition, mm -hmm. that's just simply not true, for mm -hmm. one thing. And I was wondering, you know, if if they had the false information where it came from, or the not exact information. Uh, they uh, could observe Native Americans when they went to Niagara Falls, and sometimes they visited them in the reservation in Great uh, uh, Canyon. And uh, mm -hmm. they uh, sometimes at, uh, at the shows, and they saw, um, uh, usually the Native Americans uh, were uh, demonstrating their uh, their oh. national uh, national right. rituals. So Russians thought that everything was for sale, that they mm. were abusing their own exoticism. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's uh, that's why they thought they they would not respect them for that. Because not uh, because now they not only they do not fight, but they try to get money for mm -hmm. uh, being so so different and exotic. Okay, and for African Americans, again, you know, they were respected more because uh, I I believe that because of the projections of uh, the peasants onto African Americans. Okay, and they weren't projected onto Native Americans. No. Yeah. No. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, Circassians and sometimes gypsies were projected mm. onto onto Native Americans. Okay, not good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your attention.